So this is our, uh, our, our round table Q and A, but because of uh, Beltway's equipment, Christine got cut off uh, with a couple of things that she wanted to uh, ask and some a statement or two she wanted to make. So we're gonna let her finish up what she wanted to say. And then I've got a couple of questions and uh, Leah's monitoring the questions coming in via the chat. And so if there's any coming in, she'll send them to us and then uh, we'll, we'll handle those as they come in. Plus we got a couple of questions here that uh, Randall and I talked about last night that we thought would be um, important to, to discuss. So we'll turn this over to Christine first and let her finish up what she was wanting to talk about. Thanks, Mike. Well, really, it was a question for you. Okay. Um, when we got cut off was how do you handle um, couples that just live together? Because clearly, um, I think part of the reason that the divorce rate has gone down is because less, less young people are getting married. It's just this, we'll live together, we'll have these children together, but then they separate and there is a need for splitting assets, custody, things like that. So how do you handle if a couple comes in that just lives together? Are living together? Are they, what are they coming in for, I guess? For counseling, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay, so the way that that we would we would approach that is, we uh, we have a, uh, a a written statement about marriage, and and we believe that uh, our written statement is that marriage is a, a gift from God. It's between one man, one woman for life, and uh, so we we acknowledge a a biblical legal marriage. Okay, and that's in that's in almost everything we do, and so. We encourage that, and we have some science that backs that up. That uh, that we know that's not Christian um, research; it's secular research. But we know that, depending on social economic uh, levels, that when couples live together prior to getting married, they have a higher rate of divorce. And we share that with them. We talk about um, if they if they profess a faith uh, in, in Christ and and are Christians, and we talk about then when what is biblical and then we go over the things that are biblical and uh, it's really not as much about um sin or you're wrong uh, even though it is but it's also about it's just not healthy it's not the best choice it's not the healthy choice uh, we want to encourage every couple to honor god in their relationship mm -hmm. and so that's really the focus is how are we going to honor god is this honoring god and then i'm not going to make that I mean, I can, but I, I want them to see it and make that declaration, not me. And so everything that we talk about in marriages is, is, is about what's the healthy thing to do, the healthy thing and honoring God. And if we can get those two things in people's mind, then, then they're going to make the right choices. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's out of ignorance. It's out of uh, culture. Um, it's, it's out of their family. It's, it's a generational thing that's been handed down. And some of them have no idea that there's any different, none whatsoever. So it's an educational thing as well. Some of them have very sincere hearts and really don't know that there is a difference. Interesting. And I think that kind of segues into my next question for you is, you know, what do you, we all know, don't be unequally yoked. Right. And so in the pre-marriage classes, mm -hmm. I believe Beltway offers pre-marriage counseling. Do you think that does a good job of preventing um okay so uh, we do deal with that a lot and so uh, so we we stay on that subject an awful lot during the seven weeks that we do the the premarital and um and in that is to be fully known and transparent and when and if that happens uh then they can they can make that decision but also by not being wanting to be fully known or transparent also reveals things of their heart and I am not ashamed of the fact uh, that we have had a number of couples break up during our premarital because yeah. if one is seeking a godly marriage, then, then there are things that's just going to come up during that seven weeks that's going to make that obvious one way or another. And so many times that's what's happened. I'm not going to be married in this, this, this situation because that is unequally yoked. Um, the, only, the last thing that I wanted to get into is in case you guys aren't aware of the Children's Bill of Rights. It's something that um, I think courts and attorneys are looking at and putting in most court orders with custody. And so we can put the link, um, put the link up later, but looking at the Children's Bill of Rights and it's 
uh, things things that are beneficial to the children like neither parent shall deny the child reasonable use of the phone to place and receive calls with the other parent and it's it seems like it's so obvious like yes. you, these are things you shouldn't do but by making it part of the court order by making it part of the mediated settlement agreement mm -hmm. um, it just puts it more on the forefront for parents to be thinking about these things so that they don't come up um, don't come up later and they have in their mind well there is a court order saying i can't do this so i think people are a lot lot less likely mm -hmm. to tread on on those type of things that do injure children um, if it isn't in the court order right right and it needs to be whatever what, what needs to be the healthiest for the kids at the right. kids best interest so um we want to open the uh, floor up for any questions that you guys might have and um and uh, we had some questions that came up amongst us that we wanted to uh, uh, to talk about. And so one of the questions that we had been talking with Paul uh, and Kim about is uh, if they could go a little bit, I don't, and y'all might have covered it. Um, I don't remember if he went into detail about um, when to uh, make the decision to arbitrate versus mediate. And could you expound upon that? Sure. Okay. So if it is a if it is a church mediation, uh, we we try to get the people to sign an agreement, which is called a mediation arbitration slash arbitration, which is to say that if the mediation is not successful, that it automatically goes into church arbitration, and uh, that is a very very good tool in the mediation because it takes away the club from one of the individuals saying, I'm so mad at you in this mediation, I'm just gonna throw this into a secular court situation. I'm gonna punish you by all the money that you're going to spend with the attorney. <laughs> what it does is it gives us an extra tool as a mediator to say, look, you and the mediator are complete, you in a mediation are in complete control of the outcome. Both parties or, or several parties we as mediators are only facilitating the best practices of communication and the best practices of mediation. But if you go into arbitration and you've signed an agreement that this is gonna to go to arbitration, if you fail to come to an agreement mediation, then you, you lose that control and the arbitrator is going to, is going to do it. Uh, arbitration, arbitrator in the church is going to make the decision for you. So, uh, your question is, when does it go to arbitration at that point? Yeah. When, when you fail at mediation, okay. when, you're, when you fail to get an agreement that both are willing to sign, that this is a mediated agreement we're both willing to stand by, mm -hmm. and it does happen, mm -hmm. and so they just let somebody else decide. So. Okay, well, the other part of that was then, is there, a, is there a line drawn in the sand that says, when somebody comes to you with an issue, and you say, okay, this would be better to arbitrate than to mediate? Is there ever a, a clear cut decision about that? That's so. Uh, yeah, so that would be completely on the volition of the parties. Because when we say that, that this is better at arbitration, then that's us reaching in and taking their decision away. Okay. okay. So you always leave it up to them. That's right. Okay. So right. They, they may say, <laughs> we just let's just arbitrate this. We just need to get past this. We need somebody to make the decision so we can move on with our lives. That does happen. Okay. Yeah, All that right. does happen. Um, I got a question for Dr. Kennison. Uh, so Randall, uh, with, with all the, the great material that you brought out and talked about, um, I've dealt, I pastored two smaller churches. Uh, the denomination I came out of uh, before moving to Abilene was a very small church and all of their churches in their denomination were pretty small. <clears throat> um, so the, the practical stuff that you talked about uh, is there, uh, is, is your suggestions for all churches of all sizes, or are there some that's too small, or there's different things that would be for smaller churches versus larger churches? Uh, conflict knows no bounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, you can just, uh, sometimes it, instead of a staff member, it could be just the pastor and, and a lead elder, right? And I've seen that pretty often in a smaller church. I've seen smaller churches actually be way, way more deadly and conflicted and dysfunctional than larger churches. 
uh, because it can be generational sin uh, at work uh, within that smaller country church, you know, or people, it's kind of like the Hatfields and the McCoys. They've been feuding for, for forever, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to just jump on a little bit of the mediation arbitration thing too. Um, people who have gone through secular courts, usually the mediation arbitration clause is a very common clause in most business contracts. And, and most of the time you're going to get a retired judge who's going to be doing that arbitration. And judges are used to making decisions. Actually, I've trained a couple judges. They actually kind of suck at mediation because <laughs> they're, they're judges. They're used to making the decisions. So they usually do like 10% mediation, about 90% arbitration is what I found. And so then people walk away from a mediation experience with a really kind of sour taste in their mouth because they thought, I thought this was going to be mediation. This was just really quickly, like the judge just made this decision. And oftentimes the judge will be pretty strong with the attorney saying, hey, you need to convince your client. This is how it needs to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so Christina, she, she's nodding her head. She, yeah. she knows <laughs> how this works, right? Um, so I've been, uh, so I've done actually settlement cases with attorneys as the mediator in, uh, in, the, in the secular world as well. And I found that it's... Um, when you get the right kind of attorney, even if they're secular, it, it can be really helpful if they're uh, more of a collaborative style of, a, of an attorney. And there's a whole there's a whole process out there being called collaborative. So if you do happen to find out in the secular courts, um, you would I would really encourage you to look for somebody who's more collaborative. And then to pick up on your thought too, Christina was um, in our a lot of our documents that we uh, give to our our divorce clients is there is language in the parenting plan as well as the mediated settlement agreement about uh, basically kids' rights. And, and in that we, we talk about what, you know, telephone usage, we talk about calling mom and dad, mom and dad. And if there's a step calling them by their name instead of a mom or dad, uh, we talk about, um, you know, uh, one thing that's really interesting. Yeah, well, one thing really interesting is that parents have wanted this a long time ago, uh, and that's why I include it. It's the idea of introduction of significant others. It's mm -hmm. like, how do you introduce your next significant And the idea is to protect kids so you don't have this revolving door of other adults in their life, right? And so, um, yeah, they, 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 it usually reads like this, that you can't have a uh, girl, girlfriend or boyfriend overnight. And these are, these are secular people. These aren't always Christian people. So it's really amazing that these are things that, that even the secular folks understand are critical for kids. Um, so you can't have boyfriends or girlfriends overnight. You need it six months before you introduce somebody. Uh, they don't, you, you know, you get a, uh, you need to introduce them to your ex first. So it's not a, you know, a, uh, exam, but it's just a, it's a courtesy, right, to introduce the other party. And then, uh, and then the other thing that a lot of my attorneys don't actually like very well, but my parents love is that they actually uh, do a background check on the person just to make sure there's no felonies that come up or something, you know. Yeah. And well, so I mean, we're really all the court orders also. Pro, you have 60 days, I believe, from uh, the time. You have 60 days, I believe, to tell the other party if you reside with someone that has um, a protective order for mm -hmm. domestic violence or um, right. are as a registered sex offender. So, yeah. I mean, even in our secular contracts and yeah. decrees, that's in bold print yeah. uh, at the very end, just standard so that. You, you don't have a parent that's doing the revolving door with, you know, people that hurt kids. Right, right. Um, Mike, there was one question that came in during mine that maybe as a group we could uh, speak to, and I think it may be more me and Christina that may be the one. So it was about a grandparent situation and uh -huh. kind of grandparent, grandparent rights. Right. And that'll be a little different from state to state, but the right. grandparent was basically saying, hey, uh, my, uh, my, my kids are, uh, my child's divorced. Uh, the mom of the kids is, is really kind of withholding visitation rights of us as grandparents. And what can I, what can I do about it, so to speak? And I, I have mediated cases such, such as that. And uh, that's always usually the best way because you want to keep relationships as good as possible with that, uh, with that ex because they're the gateway to those kids, right? And you don't want to make that person a, an enemy. And so to me, whenever you can mediate that, instead of trying to go to court and force it, um, it's going to be a much better win, whether it's in the Christian realm or, or uh, the, the secular realm. But for sure, as Christians, 
I, you want to, and I think it's awesome that you guys have a conciliation center in your church. And, and so if there's churches that can act like that, unfortunately, there's not too many churches that actually have a conciliation center. But if you can find other people to help you, uh, especially maybe even an elder in a church or somebody who just you seem to feel like godly and wise that can help with this situation. Uh, to me, whenever you can uh, somehow do anything to help that relationship and not hurt it is going to be a win for the kids. Because uh, if you really get that that mom angry, um, then you're gonna it's going to be much more difficult to get access to those to those kids. Um, so yeah, it's it's I, I feel for this person. I know it's a tricky situation. Um, I would I would say do everything you can to avoid going to court in in that in that kind of a situation. I don't know, Christine, if you want to add any more to that. Well. Texas only allows very limited circumstances in which a grandparent can even file suit. Yeah. Um, and so I think that really mediation centers and the CBR, a lot of times, depending on the circumstances, if they don't have um, standing to file suit, then this would be their only forum, mm -hmm. you know, to try and repair the relationship with the child or the other parent uh, or, you know, the ex to a point to where they would allow grandparent access. Um, but a lot of times, and, and I deal with this in a lot of my CPS cases where they want to intervene and the courts just don't allow that. Right. Um, so something like this would be one of the only outlets that would be possible for a grandparent to have access to that child. Right. But you are right. And, uh, and I've already had to deal with it we, way before the CBR came around. Uh, we've had, I've had more than one of that. And the answer is always to get along with each other. That <laughs> you, you just, but when you tell them in Texas, well, you don't have grandparent rights. There's really no reason to get an attorney. It's not going to do anything, but you wouldn't want to do it that way anyway. The best way to do it is meet toward the middle for the betterment, the welfare of the kids, um, and, and not make another enemy or a worse enemy out of the ex. Um, so, but sometimes you're right, Randy, at the, the ex isn't willing at that time. There's just too much uh, water under the bridge, too much hurt. And at the time they're not. And if the, and if your son or daughter that's, that's divorced from them, aren't willing to be apart, then it's really, you're in a tough spot as a grandparent. It's really difficult, but it's worth the effort to try. It's absolutely mm -hmm. worth the effort to try. Mm -hmm. So Randy, you have any questions for any of us about what we talked about before we pound you with questions about what you talked about? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I gave some of them. Uh, didn't I? That wouldn't work. Um, I think uh, I I really appreciated. Uh, I'm very familiar with Peacemakers Ministry and and their work over the years. And uh, actually, that's one of the reasons why I didn't uh, actually focus on on church on church reconciliation. And uh, when I because I wanted to be a marketplace missionary, and Peacemakers was doing a good job in that space. And but then I got churches calling me and they knew me. And so, so I guess, I guess the Lord wanted me back, back in that area and, and working in that sphere. And there's two. Yeah. So <laughs> I've had, I, I've had people who've been a part of my, my team trained by peacemakers. And so I appreciate their work and Ken Sandy's work. And uh, so I, I feel like I'm, I've been a friend of peacemakers uh, and, and appreciate their work. And um, so we, we have a little bit of, uh, we have a few differences in our uh, our reformed the theological background, but <laughs> other than that, um, uh, other you know when it comes to actually mediation and uh, there went a lot a lot of uh, agreement in those spaces for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll I'll jump on this. Uh, Leah just texted me about a question somebody asked earlier, and then I'll open it up to you other guys as well. Um, she said earlier someone asked if divorce is a sin, and um, and so I get that question an awful lot. Um, I'll just tell you um, where, where we stand when we, when we launched the, the CBR was, uh, and it was our senior pastor that made that statement. He said, it sounds like to me that we get one more swing at the bat to help a couple reconcile. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing that they may not reconcile, but at least we get one more chance to speak into their lives. And then in that same conversation, we, we talked about mm, scripture's a little bit vague in some of these because it's not always the divorce that's the sin. It's the remarriage. If it's not within uh, what, what the 
the Lord is, is covering with all that. And so, um, it, yes, it can be. That's, that's the, the bottom answer. Yes, it can be. And sometimes it's not. Uh, some people go through divorce and there's not sin involved. Uh, and they get remarried and there's not sin involved. So it's, uh, it, it, it needs to be something that's walked out with their, with their pastor. And, and that's why we so desperately need the body of Christ involved in these guys when they're reaching out for help rather than just letting them wander around in darkness, total darkness, and wonder if what we're doing is actually healthy or should be. And I'm talking about people that uh, there's physical violence going on, there's, there's sexual mm -hmm. abuse, and they need to be out of that house, they need to be protected. And, but, but they've got this overhanging thing from years and years and years of history saying that if you divorce, it's absolutely a sin. It's not always. It's, and so it's really more than just a black and white issue. So any one of you guys want to jump so in? I would love to, to jump in on that because I went through a divorce and that's, you know, from our background, that's, that's what it was. You could never marry again because mm -hmm. it would be adultery right. if you married again. But then the, I was introduced to uh, a book that a man wrote. He was a pastor and he'd been, it was the unforgivable sin. You know, right. you, you have to live with that sin for the rest of your life. You can't ever be redeemed from that. And he thought that was just doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. that doesn't it, nothing reconciles here and so he went and did a deep study in that and, and a lot of those scriptures especially the one that says you, you know if you marry again you are committing adultery it's not the word divorce in other words there was not a certificate of divorce given it what it was really saying was being put away mm -hmm. and in that case when you are put away you are still married so if you marry someone else it is a sin it is adultery but when you have a certificate of divorce, that covenant is now broken. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, I just wanted to share that because that was, that was a huge relief to me. Um, I never wanted my divorce and, you know, I, I had small children. I wanted to marry again. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thought I'd share that. I, I run across an awful lot of people that's walking in a lot of guilt mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be walking in. Right. Uh, and, and a lot of it's caused by that kind of attitude mm -hmm. is because of that you want to say anything well no i mean there's also the obvious of thou shall not be unequally yoked so yeah. i mean you know are you going to hit them twice as a double sin yeah so now you know they should have never been married to begin with right. is divorce in that situation even wrong when um they got into it against right. god's will mm -hmm. okay so, Randy, you got anything? Yeah. You want to add? yeah. I mean, we're, this is when I talk about theological perspectives and causing conflict. This is one of those debates that Christians will have and churches will mm -hmm. have around, around divorce. And, uh, you know, I, when I uh, left traditional ministry to do house churches and I started to do divorce work as a mediator, I, people asked me, how can you be doing that as a, as a pastor? And I said, well, uh, there's a couple reasons. One is there's a whole lot of hurt people out there that no one's ministering to. And uh, I tell you, when, when I was, when I would work with people, especially Christians, and I wasn't judgmental, I wasn't there to condemn them. I wasn't there to tell them they're, uh, I was just there to pray for them and to walk through them through these deepest waters are probably going other than a death. These are the hardest waters to walk through in our lifetime. Right. And, um, they were ex just extremely appreciative that someone could just love them like Jesus would love them. And, uh, and so I have yet to ever tell somebody to divorce. And I, I've saved some marriages just like you guys are doing at CBR. Because the first thing I always ask people is, are you sure you want to do this? And are you just really frustrated or, you know, just didn't have a good counselor? Um, you know, all those things. And I, and I, I kind of I kind of use this example. I said, "Did you uh, did you try counseling or did you train to have a healthy marriage?" And I use the example of, of running a marathon. I said, "If I ran a marathon tomorrow, I could try to run a marathon tomorrow. It would be really ugly. Probably wouldn't finish it. But you give me a year to to train for a marathon, I probably won't run the whole thing, but I, I'd finish it, right? But I'd have to train for it, right? And so I ask people all the time, "Did you try?" to fix your marriage or did you train to have a healthy marriage? And there's a huge difference between those two concepts. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. Well, and, and that goes along with, I mean, uh, we, we do re-engage here, which came from Watermark Church in Dallas. 
and it's uh, it's about 26 weeks and that it is that training and, yep. and, and that's what we yep. tell them you know you, this is not an overnight success it's not a silver bullet or a magic wand this is about uh putting into it what you're going to get out and uh, so when, when we see the most success the success not that's not the right word the healthiest is when they dive in and and put the put the effort into getting healthy right. exactly right uh so uh we did have this question come in um she said, how would you address people who say that the church is handing out divorces? What safeguards could you could we put in place? Well, so th the thing with that is we're not doing a divorce at all. No. Uh, they are going through a divorce. It's called a pro se divorce. What we're doing is mediating uh, with them to, to encourage them to come to an agreement on decisions that are the healthiest decisions as they go through this. This is all theirs we're just trying to do it in a way that's the healthiest way possible in a very bad situation uh and then and then the overflow of that is if if we if we see that reconciliation is not going to happen then we immediately change course to how can we work with each individual and the kids to get them to the healthiest place possible because i think it regardless if it's a marriage or if it's a death in the family or if it's a family squabble, it's about the individuals and their individual health. And, and then they make the healthy decisions. And that's what our hope is, that if, if whatever healing and restoration can take place in their individual life, uh, if, especially if they don't feel abandoned by the church or kicked out. And, and I've just heard that. I know, Randy, you've probably heard it a lot more than we have since we're so new, but we've just heard that so many times. I just felt like I wasn't welcome anymore because it went through a divorce. Right. And, uh, and, and we want to reverse that because even if there is sin involved, it's not unforgivable. People can be healed and restored and forgiven every single time. And that's what we want is healthy individuals. You know, this, this individual makes an interesting point is uh, by superficially looking at what you guys are doing, they may come to that conclusion. Right. So, uh, how would you, just kind of a follow on question, how would you go about proactively uh, communicating that CBR is not in the business of handing out divorces, we're actually the reverse in the sense, right. I mean, is, is that something proactive that you can do in branding or? No, no. I think what you're dealing with is, is a broad group of people okay. and they're going to have their minds made up sometimes without anything. You could, you could. You could publish it uh, as much as you want it, and somebody's still going to think that. Right. So I'm not sure you could do that. Well, I think people also think, oh, common law marriage. So what we're doing is kind of like a common law divorce. No, no. we can't hand out a divorce. We can help you reach an agreement, but you still have to go to a courtroom, yeah. um, present it in front of a judge. There still has to be legal requirements mm -hmm. in that petition. We don't write the petitions um, so that what they take into court. So at no point do I think that anybody going through our process or, no, or that actually knows about the process mm -hmm. um, would say that we're handing out divorces at all because it's just not possible. The only thing that we sign that we're mm -hmm. a part of that says we worked with, with these two people and they agree to these things mm -hmm. in, their, in, in their paperwork and, and they came to, it's called the rule 11. Right. Yeah, that they agree to that. And that's what the judge loves, is that they have come to agreement. So I'm wondering if there's any way you could use the terms <coughs> conciliatory as opposed to adversarial to make that distinction. Still, you don't, you don't address uh, the individual's question, are you handing out divorces? Right. But it's, it's conciliatory. So the, about the only way you could do it, the safeguard is, is the initial meeting and make sure that you, you lay all your cards out on the table. This is what this is and make sure that there's not any un misunderstanding about what we're doing. And make an informed decision. Yeah. And we've had people say that they don't want to be part of the process yeah. because they just want to have a mediation agreement. And certainly, you know, the CVR asks that they go through certain things to try and work on reconciliation right. before that. And, and some people don't want to go through that process. Right. Um, I do have a question here for Randall that came in. Um, what sort of disputes do you see most uh, in the in the realm of elder care estate settlements? Oh, 
we can be all over the map, but probably the, the, the probably the two most common and fall in kind of two categories. One is, you know, before the loved one passes in dealing with the care of the aging parent um, and uh, conflict that arises between siblings over that. Um, I've seen uh, kids sue each, you know, want to sue each other over that. And uh, uh, again, you know, I did a case not too long ago and this, these were actually all believers, at least they, they told me that. <laughs> and, but it was uh, one daughter was willing to take on the care of mom and the other siblings would say, okay, that's fine. But then when it came time to helping support that daughter with some finances so that she could actually get a little bigger place. She was renting an apartment. Mom was actually sleeping in the same bed with her, uh, which I don't think, I think everyone said is probably not the best. And, um, but then they didn't want to give her any money to help her, you know? Um, so again, money became an issue, uh, even though they all said it wasn't going to be an issue, it became the issue and actually had a long mediation and we came up with a good formula. I thought, and every, I thought, I thought that actually the case was resolved and then uh, I came back and those two, some of the siblings kind of just nodded their head during the mediation and then they quickly unwound everything, which was really frustrating. Um, Cause I work really hard to get sustainable agreements and I just, that was really disappointing. So every now and then you're gonna get that. You're gonna work really hard to get people to, to you know, get on the same page and, uh, and then they're gonna unwind it. Um, so. And I'm sure we've all had experiences like that. Um, the other, then the other one is when the kids are actually fighting over right the estate, and they're. I just had a contact from uh, the parents lived in Arizona. The kids are living up in Illinois and in Indiana, and things went pretty well at first, and now it's going south as they, as the one person who's the executor of the estate wants to, you know, they have a right to get paid typically about two percent of the actual value of the estate depending on the state. And, uh, and so he's tracking his time and he's, he feels like he needs to do that. He doesn't, he's, he's not super wealthy. He doesn't, you know, he can't, he's taking time away from work to do this. And, and, and then the, some of the kids are, you know, disputing some of the inventory and how he, uh, you know, price things. And so it's, it would be really silly for them to go to court over, uh, these are not, this isn't a million dollar estate. I mean, there's no, there's no, issue here really other than it's becoming a, a, a family issue of, of now I don't trust my brother, um, which is really sad, you know, so, um, so sometimes it can be the trust is, is made in such a way and sometimes parents will put two or three kids as co-trustees. That's not usually a good idea. Uh, and just make one person that trustee. I had one case where the person uh, the, you know, the trust was pretty clear, but what wasn't clear is how they just said it, everything would be equally divided. Well, one of the kids was living in one of the parents' rentals and they really wanted to stay there. They didn't want to have to move and they had, there, there's enough in the assets that they didn't need to move. But the, but the trustee was saying, no, we're going to sell it and we just, we just need to do it that way. And so she contacted me and said, well, why do we have to do it that way? We don't have to do it that way, do we? I said, well, that's what mediation's for, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, that, that was actually a very successful mediation where we walked through all the assets and it was a fairly complex case. So, you know, sometimes, you know, people think uh, you can't mediate this because it's too complex. That's not true. Uh, I've dealt with some very complex, and I'm sure you guys have too, uh, very complex cases. And sometimes you need to get some legal counsel to make sure you're, you know, within legal bounds in certain areas and all, but there's uh, there's no reason you can't do very com complicated cases within mediation and keep people out of court and help hopefully retain some relationships, which especially within the church. Right. And uh, right. I've seen, I've seen, we've all seen church families just blown up over, over an estate. Right. That's just a very sad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So do you guys have any questions for any of us? Uh, I don't see that we have any new questions coming in. Randy, you got anything? Uh, I got a question for for Christina. You kind of touched on a little bit. Is uh, as a mediator, I always have to I always have to do. I do a free consultation with people, and I always look at like, is this a case for mediation? And there are there are you know I you know I. I I take on some really high conflict cases and cases that normally wouldn't go in mediation, but there are times when a case shouldn't probably go to mediation. 
So Christina, I'm, I'm curious from you as an, as, as an attorney who's worked in this area, what, what, what would be a couple examples from your perspective that this case probably, uh, and we're, we're not necessarily, we're talking a case where this probably needs to go through the courts for, uh, so what, I don't think there's very many, but there are, there are some cases I believe that are probably like that. I think, well, what comes to mind first is probably suing a corporation, like in a personal injury suit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. a trucking company or a lot of, a lot of your bigger companies um, for whether it's a wrongful death, something like that, agreeing to um, this kind of process because there's no relationship to reconcile mm -hmm. because it is a corporation. And so I don't think that that would necessarily be appropriate for the CBR or peacemakers um, for those type of things. And also, I mean, with what I do with um, the Department of Family and Protective Services, I mean, there's plenty of times where, you know, the judge will ask is, is this going to be successful in mediation? And um, if one party is adamant, like, the department's adamant that they're seeking termination of parental rights. I mean, then there's no point to mediate because it's wasting a whole lot of people's time when there's not any set of circumstances that would allow them to change their position. So I think if, you know, if you get people that are honest um, and say that they have, that there's no way that they can come to a different conclusion than what they have, um, then I think that that those cases are probably not going to be appropriate for mediation. And in those cases, like a company, like you were talking about, that would be not necessarily Christian. So it'd be Christian maybe against a non-Christian in which case, like right. what we talked about, that's not relevant. Right. We're talking about Christians against Christians within the church. <laughs> Absolutely. And I was kind of telling them about an experience that I had when I was doing some private practice and had an opportunity to go through peacemakers. And so I'm dealing with all these um, private suits and I get, I get hired on a peacemakers and you know, it was very frustrating for me as an attorney because I mean, law school trains you to win. Yeah. Um, yeah. You go to courtroom to win and you know, I'm getting, I'm getting a mediator sending me Bible verses at night asking me if I read them and I'm thinking, Okay, I'm practicing law. I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but I'm trying to practice law. And so, um, you know, and my client was, was looking at a settlement or, you know, was entitled to what I believe was about $2 million. Um, and it was her parents' company. And to me, I could not, as an attorney, advise her to, um, to walk away with basically nothing um, but the relationship was restored. So, you know, as an attorney, to me, I'm not going home telling people that, oh, I won <laughs> today because, you know, they didn't get what I believe that they were entitled to, but um, it's now a healthy relationship that, you know, they had been estranged for probably two years at the time. So, you know, attorneys really have to think outside the box as to what what is a win yeah, um, success. in order to get a, you know their right. heads around these these types of mediation right yeah well all of this is none of it's is black and white and cut and dry mm. but but the fact that our whole premise of, of today was that the church needs to be more involved and the fact that we haven't been um and has left a lot of people very wounded and so we've got a lot of wounded people out there uh, that doesn't have a very high regard for church or the body of Christ. And so that needs, that needs to be changed. We need, we need to be willing to, um, to be involved in really the messiest situations so we can, we can help people get to healthiness. It's funny you talk about perspective. I mean, hearing your story, Christine, I'm, I'm jumping up. I'm doing jump, uh, jumping <laughs> jacks inside <laughs> me saying, that was a win. <laughs> uh, it's it's really you're 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 looking at it from two different prisms, two different mm -hmm. paradigms: the conciliatory versus the adversarial process. And you know, I I uh, I think you when know, we talked about this before we came on, is that the bylaws and for attorneys, the ethical bylaws 
state that you must zealously, I think that's the word they use, zealously assert the rights of your client. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that, that is completely foreign language in a conciliatory mm -hmm. process. Uh, we, we are zealous, actually we're, I guess it's still zealously, we're trying to zealously pursue God's interest in the resolution of this conflict right. as much as we can. So I think secular mediation is you're impartial and you're neutral. Uh, Christian conciliation is we're impartial. We're not taking sides, but we're not neutral. Right. You know, we're actually going to try to speak where God would speak in this situation. And that's testing the level of maturity that we have. And, and that's why we have to rely on the adherence of the word of God, because <laughs> We say something and says, is that your idea? Well, actually, no, it's not. You know, it's we got to lead in with the scriptures and not try to substantiate what we're saying. So, yeah, two different paradigms. And I don't think that people understand that they can walk away with so much more in the mediation process than they can in the court process. Because the court kind of has, I mean, given a set of circumstances, I can kind of say what's probably going to happen in court or what's most likely. And it's very cookie cutter. It's in the tech, it's in the code of um, at least on a divorce case. And so you're, limited you, to that you're very, very limited. And, and in a mediation process where you're already thinking outside the box mm -hmm. because you're not um, you're not fighting. Right. You're trying to mm -hmm. trying to have some sort of let God into that conversation. Um, you have so many options that you can come up with and be creative mm -hmm. in a mediated settlement agreement um, that benefits both you, the other party, and if there's children involved, definitely children. Especially the kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, our time is up for today. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Leah and Renee uh, for uh, helping us with all the technical stuff. Yeah. Apologize yeah. again for Beltway's um, <laughs> Wi-Fi router that went down. I really, <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry about that. Uh, but thank you, ACU and the Summit for allowing us to be a part of this. Uh, and, and I just believe God's going to use this to touch a lot of people around the world. Thank you, Dr. Randall Kennison, for joining us from Portland, Oregon. Um, so keep the water hose out and make <laughs> sure you're safe, buddy. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kim and Paul, for making it down from South Lake. It's thank been a great two days. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. And Christine, thank you for uh, a mother's heart and a, and a heart for the body of Christ and, and an attorney uh, all wrapped up in one. You are a rare package, young ladies. <laughs> let me pray. So let me pray for you guys, and uh, then we'll get out of here. So, Father, thank you uh, for this incredible opportunity, and I pray that um, that we have brought the fish, the fish and the bread, and you're going to multiply it. Mm -hmm. That you're going to touch hearts uh, that need to hear and need to be a part of this, and uh, and the connections around the world that uh, will bring about more health and more uh, reconciliation and um, just restoring um, uh, relationships and protecting kids. And uh, Father, we just thank you for the call to this challenge and it is a challenge and and it's not an easy one but i believe that uh, that you're in the forefront that you've called us to this and that there's so much fruit being produced and so lord thank you for uh for all these guys and the work that they put into this and i thank you for acu and for david ray and leah and and renee and all the others that helped out and is helping out with uh with summit and I just, I just pray that you have been honored above everything else, that this has been in your name and for your glory, and it honors you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.